How does sanctification work during the dispensation of grace? This is a good question. It does not have a short answer, so we're going to spend some time together. Start with me in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And uh, we may take some time beyond uh, 8 o'clock tonight. And uh, so just that's warning. Enjoy as much as you want to, uh, but we are going to possibly take some more time to give this the, the full attention that it deserves. 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now that's a verse you are all familiar with, but let me just make this point. So part of being approved is rightly dividing the word of truth, but notice with me the first part of the verse. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman. It doesn't say a manager. It doesn't say a delegator. It doesn't say a boss. It says a workman. So to be approved, to, to study properly requires work. It's not passive. Sometimes people have the idea that, that watching videos is enough, and I'm going to just tell you it's not enough. It can be helpful, but it is not sufficient. There is more that must be done in terms of individual study. So we're going to start with this. We're trying to understand how sanctification operates during the dispensation of grace, during the time period in which we live today. Now, the first thing that we're going to have to just come to terms with is this. The word sanctify is used in more than one sense in the scriptures. In other words, it's used different ways in different places. Now, some people don't like that. They have the idea in their heads that it should only ever be used one way. The problem is the Holy Spirit doesn't agree with that. We've talked on, on this program before about the word saved, and the word saved in Scripture can mean different things. Sometimes it means salvation from hell, but other times it can refer to a city being saved from destruction. There's times in Scripture where people are saved from deception. So there's different ways to be saved in the Scripture. Not different, not different plans of salvation. That's not what I'm saying. There's only, the only way to be saved is through Jesus Christ. So let's, let's not be confused about that. But what I'm saying is the word saved is used in different ways. The word sanctify is used in different ways. So as we study this, we're going to have to look at the different ways the word sanctification is used. Now get with me Romans 8. I want to show you another principle before we jump in, and that is this. Sometimes Scripture will give meanings to words that are specific to the Scriptures. Romans 8.23 is an example. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. The adoption in that verse, to wit, to know, to be specific, is the redemption of our body. Now, if you pull up a dictionary and look up the word adoption, it's not going to use that meaning because that is a specific meaning that Scripture has given to the word. So as we study adoption in the Scriptures, we're going to use that definition. Another example I'll give you, and this is your homework. Are you ready? Does the Bible define the word hand the way that we normally do? And the answer is it doesn't. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll leave that as a homework assignment to figure out why I say that and if that's true or not. But I'm going to tell you the Bible uses the word hand in a way that is different than our common understanding. So what we're seeing is as we come to the Scripture, we are going to let Scripture define its own terms when it does so. It doesn't always do that. Many terms it simply uses according to their normal, everyday meaning. So I want to start with this. I want to show you a couple of dictionaries here. Let's start here. And uh, I'm first going to start with the Oxford English Dictionary. And this is something that's available online. Often you can get a membership to the Oxford English Dictionary 
through your local library, so there's different ways to do it. But I want to just show you a couple things about, uh, about it. So here's the word sanctify. That's the word that we're interested in. And as I just scroll down here, you're going to see there's the first definition to set apart religiously for an office or function to consecrate. Verse meaning two, to canonize, to make a saint of. Ver, meaning three, to honor as holy, to ascribe holiness to, and so on. So there's different ways that there's different meanings that sanctify has. Now, I want to show you two things about the Oxford English Dictionary that are very interesting. The first is it will give you the years of, of uh, different quotations. So in other words, meaning 3A is to honor as holy, to ascribe holiness to. Well, why do they say it means that? And what they'll give you is they'll give you a list of times where the word was used in a piece of literature or in a publication and it will tell you the source and it will tell you the year. Very helpful because one of the things you can do is you can then look and see how those words were used at the time the King James Version was translated. So that's a very helpful feature. Another helpful feature I want to show you is this. I'm going to run the word find and I'm going to do B-I-B-L and you might know the next letter. B-I-B-L, now watch what happens. Look at this. It's going to show me all instances. So in 1526, in Tyndale's translation, he used the word sanctify in 1 Peter 3.15. In 1582, the Reims, which is not a version we would endorse, used the word in Matthew 6, verse 9. So one of the things you can do is you can go through the Oxford English Dictionary. You can see the different meanings. You can see the source of where they were used a certain way. You can see the year, and you can see various biblical uses of the word. Very, very helpful in getting an understanding of how that word is used. So that's the Oxford English Dictionary. That is the authoritative dictionary in the English language. There is nothing better than that, period, end of story. It is the gold standard. Now, I want to show you something else that I view as this is the, the silver. This is almost as good. It's very, very strong. And what this is, is this is Webster's 1828 Dictionary. This is the American Dictionary of the English Language, and this is just a terrific dictionary. This is available free on the Internet. So if you go to Webster's Dictionary 1828.com, here it is. So I'm just going to go up to the search bar and I'm going to type in sanctify. Look at that. And notice what it does. It pulls up a bunch of meanings for me. And so let's notice one thing about this. And this is something that I sort of enjoy about Webster's 1828. It will give you the different meanings and then it will frequently give you a Bible verse that shows how the word was used. So if we go to the second meaning of sanctify, to, se to separate, set apart, or appoint to a holy, sacred, or religious use. As an example, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, Genesis 2, verse 3. And you can see here Exodus 19.10, John 10.36, and so on. So the Webster's 1828 Dictionary is a tremendous resource because it will not only give you the meanings of the words, it's free, it's available online, but it'll frequently give you Bible verses that you can consult to see how the word was used in the scriptures. So one final thing before we jump in, what we've seen from both the Oxford English Dictionary as well as Webster's 1828 is that the word sanctify has multiple different meanings. So as we look at the different verses which we're about to do, we just have to begin with that understanding. The word sanctify can be used in different senses. All right. So now what we've done is we've looked at the, the two leading dictionaries. We, we've, I haven't read them all to you, but I, I've looked at them. And as you're doing this study, that's what you would do. Now what I want to do is let's go to the Bible. So we're going to run the word sanctify. S-A-N-C-T-I-F, wild card. And I'm going to run that, but then I'm going to refine it a little bit. So first we're going to let it pull up the terms, and then I'm going to show you why I'm going to restrict the range. The first thing that we would do, because the question that we're trying to answer is, 
how does sanctification operate during the dispensation of grace? Now, it's good to look at, the, at, at all of Scripture for the sake of time. You can see there there's 141 times where it's used in Scripture. I'm going to narrow it down for purposes of this study. So I'm going to go to Advanced Options here. I click on Advanced Options, and you can either choose a predefined range or you can set a range. I'm going to set a range, and what I'm going to set here is I'm going to set Acts to Philemon. Now, we, why am I doing that? Here's the reason I'm doing that. We know that Paul's epistles are Romans to Philemon. So as we think about sanctification during the dispensation of grace, obviously we want to include all of those. Hebrews is not written by Paul. People sometimes think it is. It, it is not. You can tell that if you read Hebrews chapter 2. But the reason I'm going to include Acts is sometimes there are uses in the book of Acts, which is obviously a transition book, that are they're good to know about, and they can be helpful. So I'm going to run the search for Acts to, uh, Acts to Philemon. All right, so we have some answers here, and what we'll notice here is there are two times where sanctify is used in Acts, we'll look at those, and then there's 13 where it's used in Paul's epistles. So let's just go ahead and jump in. The first time that sanctify is used in this range is in Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Now, it uses there, it, it, it describes it as which are sanctified, present tense, they already are. And get with me Acts 26, 18. And we're going to go to Acts 26, 18 next, because I think it's going to clarify what we just saw in Acts 20, verse 32. So Acts 26, verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive, the for, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, notice, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So how did they get sanctified? By faith that is in me. So did they get sanctified by living a holy life for 30 years as a saved person? Or did they get sanctified by having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in a moment? It was in a moment. So just look at it again. That they may receive forgiveness of sins. That happens in an instant. And inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So an individual gets sanctified by faith in Christ in an instant. What we've seen in Acts chapter 20 and Acts chapter 26 is that these folks were sanctified not by a long process of holiness. They were sanctified in an instant when they had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to read to you one of the meanings of sanctify from Webster's 1828. It's the second meaning, to separate, set apart, or appoint to a holy, sacred, or religious use. In other words, it's, it's to take something and to separate it, to set it apart for a holy, sacred, or religious use. And I'm going to suggest that's what happens to the believer at salvation. When, when you have faith in Christ, when you believe the gospel, you're saved in that moment, and you are set apart to a holy use. God has purposes for you that are holy. You are set apart from the very moment that you have faith. Let's go to Romans 15. So now we're going to look at some of the Pauline uses of sanctify. Romans 15, verse 16. 
that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. I'm going to suggest to you that meaning is similar to what we've looked at already. Gentiles are sanctified by the Holy Ghost. They are set apart to a holy use at the moment of salvation, and that happens by faith. Get with me 1 Corinthians 1. In 1 Corinthians 1, you're going to see something similar. First Corinthians chapter one and verse two. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now, I want you to think about that verse very carefully. Think about the Corinthians for a minute. Were the Corinthians living holy lives? Were they living in such a way that what God did is he looked at them and said, wow, you guys are hitting it out of the park. I'm just thrilled with your holiness and your sobriety and your good judgment and your excellent behavior and your wonderful speech. Or did Paul write 1 Corinthians because, hey, guys, you got lots of problems and I'm going to have to write you this letter of rebuke because you're doing all kinds of things that are wrong. Well, you know that it's, it's the latter, right? 1 Corinthians is a book of, of reproof. So now look at this verse again. Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. See, what that verse is saying, the Corinthians were sanctified even though they were not living properly. That tells you that their sanctification, their calling to be saints, took place the moment they were saved. That tells you that that sanctification is not dependent upon behavior. It's not dependent upon holy living. They were set apart for a sacred use at the moment of their salvation, even if they didn't always walk in it. Get 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, 1 Corinthians 1, 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Get with me 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we're going to see something here that I think is a similar usage, so let's just read it and we'll deal with them both together. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. And let, let's start in verse 9 to get the context. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Some people get scared at that, that verse because they think, wait a minute, I'm not living the way that I should. Well, let's keep reading. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now that list can be a little bit scary because if you're honest, you see some of those, those things in your own life and thought patterns, don't you? I mean, if we're being honest. Verse 11 Notice this, and such were some of you. What a wonderful phrase. In other words, all those things, you were that, but you aren't that. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. I love 1 Corinthians 6, 11. I think it's powerful. Here's what it, what it means. As you reflect on your life and you think about some of the most horrible things you've done, and by the way, Paul says forgetting those things which, that are behind. 
So it doesn't do any good to dwell on them. But what, what do you do when you feel guilt? What do you do when you feel condemnation? What do you do when you feel regret? Do you ever have thoughts occur to you where you think, I, I just hate that I did that. I wish I had never done that. I wish I had handled that situation differently. If I could change it, I would, but I can't, and it bothers me. The human condition is to have things like that. Let's just be honest, right? Have you ever said something that you wish you hadn't said? Well, you, you know that to be the case. Well, how do, you, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that remorse? How do you deal with that guilt? Look what 1 Corinthians 6.11 says, And such were some of you. You no longer are what you were. You're a new creature in Christ. All those sins, all that wickedness, whatever torments your conscience, it's no longer who you are. You're done with it. Hopefully that frees you. Hopefully that frees you from guilt and condemnation and regret and fear. Now, here's what I want you to get from this verse. When it says, but ye are sanctified. See, that's something that happened to you at salvation. Here's the glorious thing that happened from the moment before salvation to the moment after. You were a guilty sinner. You were lost. You were on your way to hell. But you had faith in the gospel. You believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in a moment, you went from being that guilty sinner that was on his way to hell, that was going to spend an eternity in the lake of fire. And now you have this position in Christ for all eternity. And not only that, you've been justified. You've been declared righteous. You've been washed. You're not dirty anymore. You've been cleansed from your sins. And you have been sanctified. You've been set apart to a new and holy purpose. That's what happened for you at salvation. All right, let's get the next one. Now, this next one is going to be tricky, and we're going to take a few moments on it because this is one of those that, that people just struggle with because of what it says. So get 1 Corinthians 7, 14. 1 Corinthians 7, 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Well, what does that mean? How does the unbelieving spouse become sanctified? Well, to just start, it can't mean that they become saved, right? In other words, if a spouse is an unbeliever, they don't become saved because their, their wife, their husband is a believer. Look with me at verse 16. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Well, that tells you that the, the unbelieving spouse, they're not saved. Yet verse 14 says they're sanctified. Well, that obviously tells you that the sanctification in verse 14 that we're looking at, this is different from the sanctification we've looked at in the past. Those sanctifications belong to a saved person and occurred the moment that they had faith in the gospel. So this sanctification is something different. Now, notice what verse 14 says again. Notice the last part of the verse. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy? Okay, so there's something going on here because there's two people that are married. One's an unbeliever. The unbeliever isn't saved based upon verse 16, but they are sanctified and the children are called holy. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's just, let's just run a little search here. Are you ready? If we run a search about H-O-L asterisk and then C-H-I-L-D asterisk. So we're going to see all the verses that have holy children in the scriptures. So it'll capture holy, holiness, etc. It's going to get all of them. Now, the interesting, we're gonna, the interesting thing we're going to see when we run that search, just a little refill there. 
Oh, and see, here's what it's going to do. It's going to pull up hollow and so on. And I'm going to tell you this, and you can just decide, you can validate this. So this is another part for your homework. Are you ready? In the scriptures, there is only one child that is described as holy. Can you guess who it is? Jesus. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 verse 27. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus. Acts 4 verse 30. And that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. So the only child other than in 1 Corinthians 7 that's described as holy is Jesus Christ. So what's going on in 1 Corinthians 7 14? It can't mean that the children of the unbelieving spouse are somehow superior to those of the believing spouse. That doesn't make any sense. So go back to 1 Corinthians 7, 14. Notice the first word of the verse, for. For is a term that's essentially saying because of. So whenever you see for, you know that it's in the middle of a thought. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up to verse 12, and we're going to read those verses to get the context. So 1 Corinthians 7, verse 12. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. So verses 12 and 13 deal with the situation of what happens when there is a believer married to an unbeliever. What should be done? And what the verses say is that if the unbeliever is pleased to dwell, to remain, then the believer shouldn't divorce them. They shouldn't separate from them. They should stay together. What verse 14 does is it's, it begins with the word for. And it's giving the reason why they should stay together. And the reason why is for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. So what it's saying is, believer, you don't have to depart from the unbelieving spouse. For what reason? For because of the unbelieving spouse is sanctified. doesn't mean the unbelieving spouse is saved. It says the unbelieving spouse is sanctified. Now, let me ask you this next question. Are you ready? Where would a believer possibly get the idea that they should divorce the unbelieving spouse? Why would they think that? And the reason why, I think, is in the context of 1 Corinthians 7, there's a chapter right before it called 1 Corinthians 6. So look with me at verse 15. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What, know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So what is 1 Corinthians 6, verses 15 to 17 saying? Well, what it's saying is, for someone who is a believer, they are joined to Christ as one spirit. Since they are joined to Christ as one spirit, it is completely wrong, inconsistent, terrible, bad, and overall not good to be one with a harlot, right? Because if one is one spirit with the Lord, then one shouldn't be one body with a harlot. It tells specifically not to do that. It seems to me what's going on in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, is that the, the question raised by the believing spouse is this, I am one spirit with the Lord, but my spouse is not one spirit with the Lord if they're an unbeliever. So is that a 
a union that I should avoid? Is there something wrong about this marriage union? Because I'm one spirit with the Lord and my spouse isn't. Well, Scripture answers that question. And what it says in verse 14 is for the unbelieving spouse is sanctified by the believing spouse. They're not, they don't become saved, but they're considered sanctified by virtue of the believing spouse. So that's what the, what's going on there. And then that, that's why it means, so look then at verse 14 one more time. 1 Corinthians 7, 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. So it is a proper union. Then notice what it says. says, Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. So since it is a valid union, the children are clean. The children wouldn't be clean if it was an invalid union. But the Lord considers it a valid union because it is sanctified by the believing spouse. That's what's going on there in that passage, in my opinion. Now, that's a lot of work um, to, to get to that conclusion, and that's why people often decide, well, you know, it's easier just to pick up a commentary, or, you know, the reason I love a study Bible is it's like having a test with an answer key, right? Because you just go to the bottom of the page, and it'll tell you what to think. Well, you can use those things as inputs. You can use those things to stimulate your thinking, but there is no substitute for actual study of the Word of God. There's no substitute for looking at cross-references, for reading the context, and coming to an understanding based upon research. All right, get Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. So we're going to continue now, and we're going to look at the next use of the term sanctify. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Well, in this verse, sanctify is used in the sense of cleanse. And this is the church being sanctified and cleansed by the washing of water by the word. In other words, the church is purified, is sanctified by the word. Get 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, 1 Thessalonians 4 is going to introduce us to a new meaning, so let's pay close attention to it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. So now think with me for a minute. A few moments ago, we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. And when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he described, that he said to them, they are sanctified. Well, there were people in Corinth, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there was a lot of non-sanctified behavior going on that was in violation of this verse, right? There was. But in 1 Corinthians 1, when Paul said that they are sanctified, that they were sanctified, he's clearly referring to what happened to them at salvation. At salvation, they were set apart for holy purposes. What 1 Thessalonians 4 is talking about is not the setting apart that occurs at salvation. It's talking about your ongoing manner of living. Let's look at it again. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. In other words, that's a day-by-day -day decision the believer needs to make to abstain from fornication. Verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. This sanctification in 1 Thessalonians 4 isn't one that occurs at salvation. This is the ongoing sanctification in the believer's life as they walk the way that they should. Look at verse 7 to see a, a clear explanation of this. For God hath not called us unto cleanness, but unto holiness. What God has done is he's called us to walk as the way that we're supposed to. We're supposed to walk in sanctification and therefore abstain from fornication. So we see there's a difference there. Look with me at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 
1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, here's the reality. You determine what the judgment seat of Christ is going to be like. So every believer is going to go through the judgment seat of Christ. They will appear there and they will give an account for their works as a member of the body of Christ. And we're all going to be there. Well, you know how it's going to go? You're going to decide, right? Because you're, you're going to decide on a daily basis how you walk, how you live, how you serve the Lord. And it's up to us, right? We're going to control that. What, what 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, In the very God of peace sanctify you holy, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. He's not saying that they'd be preserved from hell. That's already resolved. That's a done deal. What he's praying there is that the saints would walk the way they should so that when they get to the judgment seat of Christ, they're blameless. They're not to be blamed. That's the practical day-to-day -day sanctification that takes place as the believer chooses to walk the way they should. Get with me 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. What happens is the way salvation works is you're set aside by the Spirit when you believe the truth. That's how you, that, that, that's how it, it operates. And there's a, a salvation and a sanctification that takes place instantaneously when you believe the gospel. Get 1 Timothy chapter 4. And we're going to see another way that sanctification is used. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 4. 1 Timothy 4, 4. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Verse 5. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now here's what that passage is telling us. Meat during the dispensation of grace is sanctified by two things. The word of God and prayer prayer. So let's talk first about the Word of God. If you think about the Old Testament, were there some unclean animals? There were. You can read about them in Leviticus chapter 11. There were some animals that it was unclean to eat. We've talked recently about Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, Peter has a vision where he perceives all manner of four-footed beasts and creeping things. And the voice says to him, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And he says, Not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything common or unclean. In other words, what he's saying is, I had this vision, and a bunch of those animals were unclean, so I'm not going to eat them. And then Peter had to learn that God had cleansed them. What I want you to get is this. If we were still under the Old Testament law, there would be meat that is not clean, not clean sanctified because Leviticus specifically said that it was unclean. But we live during the dispensation of grace. And you know what the Word of God has done? What the Word of God has done, look at, with me at 1 Timothy 4, 4. For every creature of God is good. Every creature of God is good today. Now, I know that there are some within Christianity that will tell you, well, you're not allowed to eat pigs or pork or bacon but that's not what the Word of God says. It says, for every creature of God is good. So the first thing that was necessary to sanctify meats, to, to make them clean, is the Word of God made them clean. Now, what's the second thing? Look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. For it is sanctified by the Word of God and prayer. So the first thing God did is He made every creature of, of God clean good and clean because he sanctified it by his word. 
The next thing that he did is it is sanctified by prayer. So God made the animals clean. You can eat any of them. But what do you need to do? You need to pray about it. Now, what's fascinating about this, look, look at verse 4. And it's fascinating how when you compare verse with verse, it gives you clarity. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. That's the sanctification by the word of God. Then notice what it says. If it be received with thanksgiving, that's the prayer. So God's word made the creatures good. But what do we need to do? We need to be thankful. Now, let me pause here for a minute. What are we supposed to give thanks in? All things, right? In other words, here's what happens. We're thankful at times if we get stuff that we like. Isn't that the truth of the matter? But when there are things that we don't like, we're often not thankful for them. And if we're honest about things, aren't we very entitled and we think we deserve more and the stuff that we have, we deserve it because we worked hard for it or whatever justification we have in our minds. But scripture tells us to be thankful people. And so the way that we should think about food being sanctified is it sanctified, first of all, because God's word sanctified it during the dispensation of grace. And second, it's sanctified by our giving of thanks. So we need to be thankful for what we have. Get with me 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And look with me at verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Well, that sanctification didn't occur at salvation because it says if a man... Therefore, purge himself from these. He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified. So this is something that has to be done post-salvation for a man to be sanctified and to be a vessel unto honor and meet for the master's use. So what is it that needs to be done? Well, look at verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these... So we have to figure out what the these is. That's, that's a pronoun, and we have to figure out what the antecedent is. And what happens if you, you spend the time to do this, go up to verse 16. And the way that I normally do this is I would read, right before it, I'd read verse 20, and then I'd read verse 19, and then I'd read verse 18. And I'd keep reading until I found the antecedent. Let's just start in verse 16, and then we'll read down. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. We live in the communication age. So we have cell phones, so you can talk to anyone around the world at a moment's notice. We have emails, so you can email anyone in the world at a moment's notice. And we have text messages, and of course we have YouTube, and we have, we have endless ways of communication. This is just my opinion. You can decide for yourself. That doesn't mean that everything that is said is worthwhile. And I would argue what's happened is the more methods of communication that exist, it's nice that they exist, thankful for that. But what happens is the heart of man is full of profane and vain babblings, and they just keep increasing and increasing and increasing. And if you doubt that, I just wonder if you have internet access because there's just no end of profane and vain babblings. And what it says is they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. Now, if you read through that passage, I'm just going to suggest this to you. When it gets to verse 21, and it says, if a man therefore purge himself from these. So you're looking for a plural noun prior to this verse that you're to avoid. And what happens is it goes all the way back up 
to verse 16. Here's what that's saying. For us to be sanctified and meet for the master's use, you know what we have to do? We have to avoid profane and vain babblings. And there's tons of them. There is tons of them. Get with me. So look with me then at verse 21 before we go to a different verse. Look at verse 21. Do you see how it says a vessel unto honor? And then it says sanctified. And then it says meat for the master's use. Those are all similar concepts there. The vessel unto honor is the vessel that is designed. It's reserved to have an honorable use. It's sanctified. It's set apart for a holy use. And then what does it say? Meat for the master's use. Scripture does that many times where it will give you a number of phrases in, in a row where it's, it's giving you clarity as to the meaning of the term. The idea of being a vessel unto honor is that you're sanctified, you're set apart, and you're meat. You're suitable for the master's use. Get 2 Timothy chapter 2. You'll see a similar concept. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. What happens if you're going to be a soldier? You have to decide not to engage in some civilian activities, right? In other words, if there's a purpose you're trying to accomplish, you have to limit your involvement in non-essential things. I don't know if you heard this story recently or not, but one of the things that happened was uh, the United States had some ships that were out in the middle of the ocean. And what happened was there were individuals on those ships who were using social media that identified their presence. So in other words, if you had access to the software and you saw this little dot in the middle of the ocean, it wasn't a dolphin, right? There was a sailor there that was using that social media device. So what happened? The Navy said, we're not letting you guys use that anymore. Because part of being a soldier is you can't get entangled with things that defeat your purpose. You follow me? Soldiers go through boot camp to get trained, to get equipped, to get skilled, to perform that that God has called them to do. So let me put it this way, and you can decide for yourself. I think what happens a lot with saved people is we get entangled with the affairs of this life. I'll give you one example that I see. Many saved people think that part of their Christian ministry is to criticize the government. And it's, it's up to you. You have freedom of conscience to do what you want to do. But let me, let me just share this thought with you. Part of being a soldier for the Lord Jesus Christ is you need to be dedicated to serving his purposes. There's a lot of things on this earth that don't make any sense. And by the way, the earth isn't going to make any sense until he returns. So if you look out at the earth and you think this place is crazy, you're right. But it's not going to be fixed until the Lord comes back. It's just not. And you can spend your life trying to fix it, but you're not going to be able to because sinners are running the thing. See, what we need to do is this. We need to purge ourselves pro from profane and vain babblings. And what we need to do is we need to be sanctified. We need to be meat for the master's use because we have a very clear dedication to his purpose, which is seeing the lost get saved and teaching right division. That's what he called us to do. Look at me at Romans 6 verse 19. I'll show you a verse that has a similar use of, of sanctification to the one we're talking about here. Look at Romans 6, 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded yourselves servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. The idea of that verse is what do we need to do? We need to yield ourselves to righteousness and holiness. So let me pull this all together. During the dispensation of grace, 
Sanctification has different meanings. We saw the meaning of sanctification where the unbelieving spouse is sanctified by the believing spouse. We saw the meaning of sanctification where what happens is the way that meat today is sanctified is it's sanctified by the Word of God and prayer. So we understand those meanings. But there's two that are really important that we need to talk about, and that's this. The first is, you were sanctified the very moment you had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. From that very moment, you were set aside for a holy purpose. Think of it this way. You get saved by believing the gospel. What happens if the rest of your life you live like a nitwit? You just do all sorts of things you shouldn't do. Well, that's not going to change the fact that you're going to be caught up and you're going to be given a celestial body and you're going to have a spiritual purpose in the heavenlies. Your setting apart to that can't be changed. That is unchangeable, inalienable, unalterable, irrevocable. That's the sanctification that occurs at the moment of salvation. But what happens the rest of your life? See, what happens is we get to decide on a daily basis what we do. We can either possess this, this vessel in sanctification and honor, so it's meat for the master's use. We can purge ourselves from profane and vain babblings. We can endure hardness, and we can choose not to be entangled with the affairs of this life. And we can be that vessel that is practically suited for the master's use. And what I would tell you is you need both sanctifications. You need the one that you get at salvation in an instant. And then what we each need to do on a daily basis is we need to walk in holiness. We need to possess our vessels in sanctification and honor. That's the high calling for our lives.